Hello and welcome to GIG's Green Talks. I'm Adrian Barnes and I'm part of Macquarie's Green Investment Group based in Edinburgh in Scotland. I'm joined here today by Peter Young, one of the trustees of the Green Purposes Company. Green Purposes Company is a unique not-for-profit company set up to approve any changes to GIG's five green purposes. And we speak regularly to the trustees of the Green Purposes Company because their broad range of expertise across the sustainability and finance sector gives them unique insights into the sustainable finance landscape. Peter, welcome. Hello, Adrian. It's really good to see you. So we're here to uh, talk, to jump in straight into current trends in green finance. Now, the 2020s have been referred to as the decisive decade for climate action. And there are other environmental concerns also requiring urgent attention. How do you say these are reflected by current trends in the finance sector? Well, I think uh, the first thing to say has been a huge uplift in the mainstream appetite for, for green and for taking action on climate and, and more widely. Um, and I think that's tremendous. But that appetite, what I see, is not matched yet by a project pipeline. Um, and the current focus on some specific climate mitigation actions is probably too narrow for those challenges you allude to that we've got over the next decade. Um, we talk about it as the uh, uh, for over the decade. I feel it's a delivery decade that we need. Um, and delivery means actually having the projects. So I think it's hugely welcome we've got that um, appetite. Um, and of course, we see it in terms of the uh, enthusiasm, for example, of the recent offshore wind rounds, where projects are available to bid for. Um, but I don't see the opportunities coming through in some other areas of the green economy. And that's a problem if we're going to meet our targets um, for over the next 10 years and beyond. Uh, I would say that, um, as you know, we work as the trustees closely with the, with the GIG, and uh, we're very supportive of the role that we know you take in nurturing new developments. This is very impactful, and it's going to need scaling up further. Um, but I do wonder uh, how we can get more serious asset classes established, you know, beyond the renewable energy area. I think that uh, work going on now in storage and in hydrogen is going to follow suit. Um, but other green areas are undoubtedly lagging. Um, I think of transport um, perhaps being next. Um, but nature-based solutions and circular economy uh, are also similar asset areas, which which really we're still struggling, I think, to get off the ground. Yeah, because it's not just um, climate finance, as, as you point out there. Um, whilst the, whilst the capital is being attracted into that, there's, there's not only nature-based solutions to deal with climate finance challenges, but nature-based solutions to... Uh, to deal with those those other environmental challenges. Um, how do you see maybe in terms of, say, public and, and, and private finance working together and coming together to, to address those kinds of challenges? Well, I think it's enormously important that they uh, work in concert. Um, and I think the public sector particularly has a role in establishing markets uh, and in setting ground rules um, to enable markets to develop. But we shouldn't delude ourselves. The private sector capital is going to be by far the dominant force. And we must make sure that everything is done to make those markets work for the private sector. Um, it's very good to have exploratory work and seek all funding for the public sector, but it's never going to be of the scale. Um, and the recent work that, uh, that we've carried out ourselves, in fact, on nature-based solutions, you know, shows how big the funding gap is. Um, and it's an order of magnitude more than we can expect the public sector to um, uh, deliver. The question is how you actually get that um, value, uh, how, how you get that sort of consistency in the markets and how you get the value in projects in terms of returns, uh, which investors can invest in. We all know of the benefits, the multiple benefits, the co-benefits from nature-based investing, for example. But what we don't see um, is clear financial return lines in a conventional fashion that enable these things to um, compete with conventional market investment opportunities. Yeah, sure. And I guess you, you talked a little bit about the, the funding gap. I guess there's, there's the, the two perspectives of the, the amount of funding we need to deliver the change, but also you can look at it as the, the opportunity for investment. In terms of opportunity, particularly for, for commercial investors, where do you think those kind of main opportunities will emerge over the next decade? Well, I think they'll emerge in, in two ways, firstly, um, and to sort of steal the economy, a green economy mantra of financing the green and greening the finance. It's the same with sustainability, I think, by financing sustainable activities, but also by bringing sustainability into all finance activities. In other words, by focus not just on what projects are financed, 
but also how these projects are executed. And if we can get the whole financial system executing their projects in whatever sector they're choosing to invest in, in a way which delivers sustainable outcomes, that will make an enormous difference. But first and foremost, we do need to broaden this pipeline of sustainable projects. Um, and we need to find a way in which those become uh, more viable uh, and more uh, give better returns for investors. Um, and that does require some pretty major market changing uh, decisions by the public sector and by the regulatory community. Yeah, yeah, great. And I guess one of the other challenges as green finance and sustainable finance really hits the mainstream, and, uh, and more investors are involved is is one of, of greenwashing. So, making sure that, uh, that that green investments or sustainable investments are are really doing what they what they say they're doing, that they're not being mislabeled. Would you say that greenwashing is is prevalent in the finance sector, or are investors being overly worried about this? They're not being overly worried at all. I think you know this is a sort of real um, pressure point for me. I'm I'm passionate about the need to find ways of avoiding greenwashing undermining these nascent markets. It's a sort of well-established thing that where you have new markets, and we saw it with the early carbon markets, if there is elements of, of greenwashing going on, it can really destabilize those markets in the early stage. And I think we have a definite problem. I would distinguish between perhaps two ways in which that comes. There is the overt greenwashing, which is where it's deliberately done. And there's also a lot of naive greenwashing going on um, and sustainability washing, which is where I think quite well-meaning investors you know, want to badge what they're doing and believe maybe that what they're doing is sustainable. When it actually comes to proper scrutiny, uh, then you can see that actually they're not meeting meeting the, the requirements. Um, so I think we, we do need uh, different regulatory approaches to to drive the market towards sustainability. Um, and we need to do that in a way it doesn't cause confusion uh, and doesn't allow naivety to persist in the market. Um, and I have to say, you know, we've got a long way to go. Um, I just picked one recent thing that's been in the news is, is around what is the EU taxonomy going to include, not include. And we've heard gas, we've heard nuclear. And the answer is you've got to look at the context. You've got to look at it quite uh, in quite some detail. So I think the other message I would have is that to avoid greenwashing, really what you need is a depth of analysis. Uh, and that's something, of course, that we get good exposure to because of your own work in your own team in terms of, you know, the green impacts that the Green Investment uh, Group um, provide. You need that kind of depth of analysis. I don't see that kind of depth happening across the market yet. And until that quality of information is improved, um, then we will see a risk of, of, of greenwashing. And, and I guess in terms of improving that quality of information um, and, and, and making it of a, of a similar quality across the board, um, how can we help give investors that certainty that their money is being invested and, and delivered into you know, assets and projects and activities that deliver those green or sustainable outcomes. And do you think, you know, there's, there should be a focus on voluntary standards or regulatory action? Or where do you think the, uh, the, the real opportunities lie to improve that? Well, we probably need both of those tools, Adrian. I think, you know, we, 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 we've got um, a long way to go here, but it's been really good to see that the need to develop globally recognised standards and metrics to allow markets, you know, to give quality and assured evidence on sustainability and ESG performance and impacts, you know, has been recognised. What, of course, we've had is a bit of a sort of a, 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 a consequence of that, um, which has been a plethora of competing and overlapping and conflicting standards. And over the last 18 months, particularly with the emergence of some of the initiatives, such as GFANS, the Glasgow Finance um, for Net Zero, and uh, that, that was launched in COP26 last year, and the new um, International Sustainability Standards Board that's been proposed by the um, IOSCO and, 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 and uh, um, IFRF. Oh, well, there we are, there's one. Uh, <laughs> IFRS. Um, then we will be able to, I think, see some of these uh, consolidated uh, initiatives bringing that. And of course, that's something that I also play a personal role in because I chair an International Standards Committee on Sustainable Finance, ISO TC 322. And I think we, together with people like GRI and UNEP, also have key roles to play. Um, so I do think standards has got a huge role and those voluntary standards and those industry-based standards 
are, are important. But we also do need uh, a push from the regulatory side. And I welcome the way in which TCFD and I hope in the future TNFD are being adopted around the world by regulators as a mandatory requirement on large organizations to disclose what their climate impacts are and more, more widely in due course their sustainability impacts. Because it's only through that compunction will we get consistent data across the whole market and be able to make really meaningful decisions about uh, where investors take their money and also be able to properly applaud those really good quality projects, which are the leaders to show us how we're going to invest in the future. Yeah, great. And you talked a lot, I guess, about there about um, improving the, the quality of evaluation and disclosures in order to, to prevent greenwashing and really building, I suppose, expertise and understanding of sustainability out across the sector. Do you think the finance sector understands enough about sustainability issues or, or indeed vice versa? Does, do, do sustainability professionals really understand the finance sector? That's a really good question, Adrian, because I think I think that is actually at the nub of one of the challenges we have. You know, we've had a, a, a sector which has um, tended to reward those who really go deep into particular areas. But actually, sustainability and addressing these issues we're talking about today requires a real multidisciplinary effort. And it requires us to have much more learning from different sides and different careers um, so that the two can cross over much more fluidly. And we have far too much sustainability and environmental expertise sitting in, if you like, one place and the finance expertise sitting in another. And very few who really understand one another to the degree that they can work effectively together. Um, so I, I think that that's a very, very uh, important task going forward. Um, and I think that the, the breadth of, of, of expertise um, and the um, knowledge of, of how finance works by the sustainability people um, are two things that, that have really got to be brought home. Uh, and that does mean a change in role, I think, within many financial organisations, which have traditionally outsourced these technical specialist areas, you know, to specialist uh, organisations, which has a role. But I think we have to see those um, financial organisations bringing that expertise in-house because it's only there that they will be impactful in their decision making and their core, uh, you know, core company objectives. And um, while they're outsiders, however good those advisors are, I think they won't move the uh, needle far enough and fast enough for the pace of change that we need to see. Great. Thank you. Well, a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities there. So um, Peter Young from the Green Purposes Company, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you. Goodbye all. 